Okay, perfect. So this session is recorded um, and welcome once again to, to all of you that have joined us to the MPW webinar series. So today's session is Unlocking Creativity uh, by James Barton. So we will record this session and send it to you at the end as well. So over to you, James, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, just before I actually screen share for you and get this presentation started, a, a quick housekeeping notice from myself. Um, this morning, uh, despite being in the center of, uh, of the first world, um, technology and the internet is rather playing a little bit of havoc with us. So um, in the spirit of this being an unlocking creativity uh, masterclass, I am going to be cutting a little bit between two different things in order to make sure that this uh, hopefully works for you, but it might not run quite as I first intended to. But that's the wonderful thing. Uh, it's also the wonderful thing about not over preparing for something because particularly for a topic like this, we need to be a little bit more organic and make it up as we go along. But without further ado, I'm going to kick off now. And if you cannot hear anything, Either please don't worry because you're going to get this presentation anyway and you'll be able to watch it in real time afterwards or please reply in the comment box. I have a very able bodied helper here with me uh, who will make sure that everything is monitored and at least I can try and adapt to survive as we go on. But off we go. All boys except one. Now, when I said off we go, of course, I meant with one false start and then off we go. Um, OK, let's uh, let's just go for that one last time. All boys except one grew up. Did you get the reference? It's Peter Pan. Now, I loved stories growing up. I still love stories now. I love the myths. I love the legends. I love this ability to take you from one place and transport you to another. And arguably, children are some of the most creative and imaginative of all of us. And I want you to remember that. We all nowadays say, I can't do that. I'm not creative enough. But I would argue that we've simply just forgotten how, as we've become more socially aware of ourselves, of others, and of the world around us. So today's job is simple. It's to punch through some of these barriers and try and unlock some of that creativity that is clearly there within all of us. And yes, creativity, to a degree, can be taught. So good morning and welcome to the Unlocking Creativity MPW Masterclass. And for this, I want you to take yourself to a place that you find most creative. Let's go. Well, here we are at MPW London, ready to start today's Masterclass. And just to remind you, the theme of today's Masterclass is about unlocking creativity. And we very literally are going to be unlocking doors in order to be able to release those barriers that may currently exist. We probably shouldn't be unlocking any barriers or doors here today, but as long as we don't tell anyone, then we should be fine. What I want to start with today, in order to unlock that first door, is the one minute teach. Now this can be done in the two minute teach or the three minute teach. For us today, I'm going to do the one minute teach with you. And the one minute teach goes something a little bit like this. The one minute teach says that you can teach anyone anything within one minute. If you can do that, then you have a creative mindset. So my question to you is, can you draw a cartoon now, I thought you might say that. So let me introduce something else into the equation. Can you draw a cartoon using only letters and numbers? And that is what I'm going to teach you now. So grab your pens, grab your pencils, grab those pieces of paper and do this with me. And if you can do this, 
then hopefully I will have your attention for the next hour. Okay. Right, because of our little rolling stuff, so let's forget about the video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the one minute teach for you right now. And I want you to follow this along with me. So we're using only letters and we're using numbers in order to draw this cartoon. So the first thing I want you to do, please, is to pick a feature on the face. Now, for me, I'm going to pick the nose. So I want you to do a little C on the paper in front of you. OK, one minute on the clock here. We have a C on the paper in front of us. The next thing you need to do is you need to pick another feature. And for me, I'm going to choose the eyes and I'd like you please to draw two sixes. The first one at the top of the nose and the second one here on the diagonal just slightly down. I want you to then shade in the bulbous part of that number six. We now need features in order to keep developing this face. So I'd like you to pick just the number one and I'd like you to now add in some hair just using the number one around the face. Straight hair, something I wish I'd had all of my life. Um, what do we need now? We need an ear. So for an ear, I would like you to use the number three, please. So number three on the board there. Okay. And then maybe just draw another horizontal one to finish the top. What are we missing? We're missing a mouth. So let's use a letter. Let's use uh, J, which is the start of my name there. J to give us a mouth. And we're still missing more. We need a neck. And for a neck, we're going to use a V. So will you please draw a V onto your picture there? Now, just to finish this off for the remainder of the one minute, we need a neckline. Uh, we need another letter. Let's use a C, but this C is asleep. So let's turn it upside down and finish to the left and to the right with a number one. OK, so what do we have there? We have a face. We don't have a great face, but we do have a cartoon face. And anything is conceivably possible if you understand a very basic structure. And the one minute teach is a wonderful exercise in order to be able to show the creative mindset. It's a very good exercise when you're actually doing something in school, but it's an even better exercise when you're learning for interviews. And we'll have a little bit of a look at that later on. But in one minute, I've taught you how to draw a cartoon using only letters and numbers. And if you've managed to do that, then hopefully I will keep your attention for a little bit longer technology issues aside. OK, right. So let us carry on through. So this is usually the part in any webinar or masterclass where someone extols their academic virtues and says why they are capable and why they are qualified in order to give you this particular masterclass. I'm not going to do that, um, partly because I'm not sure I am qualified to do this. I'm not a preeminent psychologist. Uh, I'm a guy with an airbrushed headshot photograph, uh, which rather gives you a bit of an interesting uh, look at my background. My background comes from a creative background. I've been in the education sector for 13 years, but I also come from an acting and a producing background as well. And what fascinates me is both of these sectors are Anyone who's got their microphone on at the moment, if you don't mind muting it for me, just because we've got a bit of interference going through. Looks at both education and uh, the, uh, the arts as well. And what I've been fascinated with over time is this ability to be able to inspire, to create, to motivate students and adults in terms of thinking more creatively, thinking more laterally and trying to actually come up with creative solutions to problems. And anyone who's been on a webinar with me so far will know that what I like to do is always be able to introduce something practical into the actual equation itself. Um, so what I don't want to do today in reality is to actually give you anything heavy. Uh, long and detailed web some very academic topics. Um, what I want to do today is have some more fun. And I'm going to use quite a lot of practical exercises. I'm going to use a lot of uh, puzzles and games and ultimately being as interactive as possible. So please stick with me. Everything has a point. Some things will work for you. Some things won't work for you. Some things you will frankly disagree with me over, but that's okay because creativity comes in all shapes and sizes. And what I'd like you to do is to be able to suspend your disbelief just 
for the sake of this session. Now, I would defy anyone to be able to say that they are not creative, because ultimately, surely lockdown has taught us that we are all creative people. We've managed to literally make our lives and our world virtual all of a sudden. OK, we've been able to come up with new exercise routines at home and find replacements for the gym. We've been able to transfer our work online. We've been able to tra transfer our social interaction. I know many people who engage with the idea of a virtual pub where they can actually meet up with their friends online. So we are all creative people in all shapes and sizes. When I went to drama school, I was taught that this word does not apply. Now, in many aspects of life, the word no, of course, applies. But at drama school, you're banned from using it. You're not allowed to use the word no at all. No is not a word that enters into your vocabulary. What instead you have to say is, well, we were taught to say something a little bit ruder than this, but the actual phrase is, OK, fine. OK, it's the idea of not blocking an idea. You have to give everything a go. So if someone gives you an idea, you can only say no once you've actually trialed it in the first place. And it's been a really good life lesson for me. Now, while I'm not an academic, there are people who are. And there's a guy called Tony Bazan who created this idea of mind mapping, if you know what that is. We will have a look at it. Um, but he basically comes up with, with these points throughout his, his research. He says that everyone is creative. And I absolutely agree. Everyone in their own right is creative. He talks about left brain versus right brain, which is a horrendously misleading term and often blocks creativity in itself when you start pigeonholing someone into one or other category. He talks about speed of thought. Speed of thought is necessary in order to, the faster you get your brain working, the faster it is firing, then the more receptive you are to creative ideas and originality of thought. And number four is originality of thought. It is taking something that is obvious in front of you and coming up with a new use for it. Number five is flexibility of thought. So it's trying to re-envisage a problem rather than just seeing it your own way. And number six is what children are absolutely amazing at doing, which is to use imagination. And the most creative people out there aren't just imaginative people, but they are people who have imagination and can then associate ideas together in order to come up with something original. I'm going to encourage you to have a look at anything. It's, uh, there's, the most watched TED talk of all time is from the guy called uh, Sir Ken Robinson. He's racked up about 67 million views now, and it's all about creativity. And one thing he says is that education, the education sector as a whole, is actually killing creativity. And I agree, it is. The education sector is set up to be very routine and very rigid in its structure. And it gives a great example of if an alien came down to this earth, what do you think that they would report back on our education system? And he says it would be the education system is set up for universities to make it in their own image. We, we learn from the top down. Our entire education system is set up to get you into university. But in reality, is that a great form of education? No, it is just a rigid, systematic way of going on to the next step. We've become too fixated on something called academic inflation. We, are, we love league tables and we love stats and all the things that dumb down education in their own way. They just prove the point that you're wanting to make. Creativity is wonderful. It's original ideas that have value. And you don't teach creativity through direct instructions. The way we do it and the way I like to mentor students and guide people, particularly in training, is it's about encouragement, it's about inspiration, and it is about mentoring. If you try and force creativity too much, then effectively you are, you are blocking it. And the life lesson I've always taken away is if you're not prepared to be wrong, you're never going to come up with something original. So that is about as heavy as we're going to get. What we need to do is warm you up. And we will, uh, we will move straight to doing exactly that. So what I would like you to do, please, is do these warm-up rhythms. Now, keep the music going. Music will do one of two things for you. Either it will distract you or it will aid the creative process. If it's going to distract you, turn it off. But please, solve these rhythms. Once you have them, please just type in the message box for me. Anyone got this one? 
No one, no one feels so bold. Ah, there we go, Andy. Thank you very much indeed. It is indeed the mother. Right, riddle number two. A monkey, a squirrel, and a bird race to the top of the coconut tree. Who do you think will get the banana first? You're very welcome, Andy. And Karina, you also came up with it. But number two, who's got it? A monkey, a squirrel, and a bird race to the top of that coconut tree. Thank you very much indeed. That is right. None of them. The answer is a coconut tree. Number three, which method is this? It is not me. I mean, it will be a one podcast. I would like to be just recently there. We go to the and last. I'm going to try and cut the gap. Down to the bottom. Very good. Now, hopefully, hopefully that should now be your, um, apparently you can't hear me. Is that right? Can you hear me now? So we couldn't hear the last, the music was really loud, but it's okay. We can move on. Okay, jolly good. Right. So we're back through. So hopefully that's warmed your brain up. And the purpose of doing all of these tiny little puzzles and riddles and what's wonderful about them is that they actually engage your brain to actually think in a slightly different way. Okay. So the technical part, we talked about left-brained and right-brained, but what does that actually even mean, okay? The left brain supposedly deals with words, it deals with numbers, it deals with logic, it's got lists, uh, analysis uh, within there. And then the right deals with everything else, it deals with rhythm and color and shape and form. And when people talk about your left brain or your right brain, what it's doing is in fact trying to put you in a box. And once you are in that box, if you're put into that left brain box, it actually starts making people think that they can't be creative. Is it actually important to be one or the other? No. Okay, what we have is we have an amazing apparatus in our head. We have a million, million different cells within our head. Okay, what's the problem is that people haven't been taught how to integrate the left brain and the right brain properly. After childhood, we become far too socially aware of ourselves and therefore we start blocking out ideas. Those who are creative are actually bringing in elements of the left brain into the right brain and the right brain into the left brain. The creative mind needs you to absolutely have both of those. Speed of thought is something that we, uh, we touched on at the start. Speed of thought, the quicker you can learn to actually train your brain to think, then the more receptive it is to original and creative ideas coming through. So keep up with doing puzzles. One of the best ones to do this because they is Sudoku puzzles. Sudokus are great. We're not going to do one now, but I've put the rules there in case you don't know how to actually do the puzzle itself. I know many people, and one person in particular, who's incredibly good at Sudoku. The Sudoku is there in order to actually allow you to start seeing patterns uh, within puzzles. But what's also great, you can, use, uh, you can use crosswords, you can use word searches, you can do anything. Children's puzzles are a terrific way of actually being able to increase the speed of your brain. The more puzzles you can do, the better. If I can give you an example, grab a paper every day, grab the newspaper into the mind game section and try that. Put that into your daily routine. Okay, if you start your day with some of these puzzles, think of what you could actually achieve during the course of that day. Another term that's become incredibly fashionable is this one, thinking outside the box. Okay, everyone loves this term, think outside the box. It means you're really creative if you can think outside the box. Now, there's a really famous example for this, and I've used it before. I don't want to do it too, uh, too slowly here. I think we can just do it quickly. But if you haven't seen it before, it's the example of connecting all line nine dots using only four lines. Your pen can't leave the paper. The lines can only be vertical, horizontal, or diagonal, but they can never curve value that can never be done 
Okay? If your pen can't leave the paper, you can't achieve the puzzle. So the way we actually then start to look at it is you have to move outside the box. It's the ultimate idea of thinking outside the box. My problem with this term of thinking outside the box is the problem too big. And for students, that often taxes them too much. So what we need to do is look at it a little bit different. Why not think of it inside the box? Okay? Think inside the box as opposed to outside of it. It's also known as something called the box strategy. The problem with thinking outside the box is it's too big. So what you need to do is impose a limitation onto the problem in order to be able to fix it. Nice little exercise, this one for you. You have a clock. What I want you to do is to take away the second hand from the clock. Okay? The second hand is gone. The question to you is if we take away the second hand from the clock, what could you think of that you would replace the second hand with? So into the message blocks, please. What could you possibly replace the second hand with? You can have anything at all that you like. Any examples from anyone at all? You take away the second hand of the clock, what would you replace it with? Well, think of where you are. I mean, perhaps you are in the kitchen. Okay. Oh, fork. There we go. We are exactly that. So you're in the kitchen. You've got a fork. Anyone else? Let's put you somewhere else. Let's say you're in a restaurant at this moment in time. Betty, a pencil. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Anyone else at all? Pencils, dots. Okay. Anything more? Feathers. Brilliant. So now we're actually going up. OK, and here's how it works. What you actually come up with is something called uh, the originality of thought grading scale, and it goes from one to five. At the bottom on number one is usually where you can't think of much at all. You end up saying exactly the same thing as the actual puzzle. So you say the second hand of the clock or a piece of metal. Then you start grading up. And by the time you get to five, five means you are more or less thinking exactly as a child. And a child might be saying something completely different. They might be saying a dinosaur tail, or they might be saying Princess Elsa's wand. I like feather, feather goes up and around a, a, a 0.4 or 0.5 or something on that particular scale. But it's about originality of thought within it. How creative can you be with the puzzle in front of you? I love this story. There's one about NASA in all of this. If you think of Apollo 13, when the Apollo 13 space shuttle ended up having a problem out in space, the oxygen tanks went and therefore they needed to come up with a creative solution. Now, this what that problem would be using only the material that they up on the space shuttle. So a limitation has been placed in there. Duct tape. Anything like that, they could only use exactly the equipment that they had down in uh, on the spaceship down in mission control. Once that was sorted, they were able to bring that space shuttle back down safely. And that was all using original creative thought. Okay. Hey, uh, audio is on and off at the moment. Well, that's a, that's a bit of a shame. Okay. The other thing I like is this. It's the creativity of a child. The creativity of a child is what actors long to have, is what we should all hopefully try and recover at some point. I, there's a really nice little story that I've got. I, uh, I have a friend who is now proudly expecting a second child. And he actually asked his son, what would you like for your next, um, for your brother or your sister? Would you prefer a boy, would you prefer a girl? What would you like? And the, uh, and the little boy thought about it for a minute and he turned around and he said, I would like Batman for my next time okay and that's a it gives a really nice little example of how children actually think they think so different from us but their minds are thinking in such a creative way so now we've imposed things on it let's look at this exercise again if we now say connect all nine dots but you can only use three lines we're now imposing limitations your pen cannot leave the paper still but you know that you can go outside the lines you know that you can think outside the box therefore can you fix this puzzle. Three lines now. You know you can go outside the box, so we've told you the limitation that you have here. Can you now fix this puzzle?
I understand the technology uh, issues we have today. So thank you for bearing with us so far. What I will say is this will all be recorded properly, almost in a studio-like feel, so it can then be sent, so it can actually be useful to you at another point. But thank you for still bearing with it for now. But can you solve this puzzle? might get something a little bit like this. Everything is possible with creative thought if you understand what you are being told in front of you. Right, so if you can, I always want you to do this. Change the location. You probably can't change the location now, but if you want to be a bit more creative, change your screen. Change your MS team screen on the back to something. Put yourself on a beach, put yourself in space, put yourself somewhere else. Changing the location can be a very valuable tool when you're trying to be creative. Okay, sometimes actually physically moving yourself can give you a little bit of something else. So creative thinking for decision making. These are some of the best things I've come across. And if I'm actually now trying to seriously work with a student, we'll look at these. And you try and identify what is going to work for each there are a few of the best that I've actually found along the way. Mind mapping is the most famous of all of them. We'll do that in a minute. Sometimes called brainstorming. The next one is right braining. For me, I quite like this one. I'm not a great drawer, but ultimately this is the idea of doodling. And some people's minds work far better with pictures than they do with words. And so what you're doing is you're drawing incomplete images and then seeing what you can combine together at the end. Provocative actions is quite a neat one as well. It makes a conscious difference to your environment. So this is what we're saying about changing your environment, or maybe you just want to pick your chair up and move it. Maybe you want to turn your chair onto the floor. What are you, can you, else can you do to your environment that makes it a little bit different from the norm? Breaking and building, so you can break up an idea and then rebuild it from scratch. This really works if you want to go into engineering because your mind is already wired a little bit in this way. For me, as an actor or a former half-bit actor, um, I used to love the glass half empty, glass half full exercise. It is where you have someone who is negative and you have someone who is positive. For every negative thing a person said, you have to find a positive reaction to it. And the last one is randomness. It's finding the connection between a word and a general thought. Okay, This is sometimes called uh, word association. Try it with a friend at some point. Uh, the friend has to give you a word. They might say black, you might say white. OK, they might say um, uh, linen sheets, you might say bedspread, you might say uh, bedroom, you might say kitchen. It's finding associations along the way. You can probably come up with a much better example than that, but I'm trying uh, to think on my feet a little bit here. So let's have a little look at the, the mind map. one. if you haven't come across a mind map before, uh, I, I presume you've been hiding under a rock all your life uh, because mind mapping is one of the most famous ways of doing anything creative in terms of brainstorming. Really easy to define. You define a central theme to start with. Okay? Word it in a clear and concise manner. What you then do is you add branches of related ideas and write down the first thing that comes to mind. From that, you can then come up with sub ideas along the way. If you can, use color. If you're using color, color can also be a nice way of identifying and picking your way through. So I think we should do one of these. I think we should actually have a little look at a mind map together. Hopefully you can see me and you can see the board. Okay. So can I have a can I have a central theme, please? World, can you give me a central theme that we can use to start with? Something to go in the middle. Universities. Universities, Bessie, that's very on point. Um, so universities kicks us off in the middle. Okay. You have to pick the longest word. I could, I could have shortened it, but I didn't. OK, so universities. Uh, I will start us off from here. I'm going to write down the next uh, word from this. I would like, if it's going to be universities, I'm going to put drinking. Someone else give me a word for universities. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Library. Sorry, say again. Library. Library. Very good indeed. Like it. Okay, a couple more. Friends. friends, indeed. We make friends for life at university, which is a great reason to go there. Anything else? One more. 
Study, yeah. Someone clearly understood the brief of why you go to university there. You go to study as well, of course you do. So now we have our first four words. So next thing from that, um, lead on a word from library. If I said library to you, what's the first word that would come to your mind? Books, indeed. Anything else? Exams. Exams. Silence. Silence. Yeah, good. Uh, what about friends? Next word. Parties. Parties. Absolutely. And thank you for doing that because now what that's going to do is allow us something different in a minute. Uh, any other words for drinking or study? It's not a trick question. It's really easy. Adventure. adventure. Thank you. Which one's that going under? Study or drinking? Is this an academic adventure or is this a drinking by adventure? Adventure. Adventure. So, um, uh, adventure. Uh, brushes. Yeah. Good. And study, uh, we'll just leave for a second because we get the points. We get the points on all of this. Now what you have, you have all these bits in front of you. You now start finding links. So once your mind map starts giving you something, you can now start seeing connections between it. So obviously drinking and parties is going to be able to connect together over here. Friends and drinking probably connects in that way as well. Okay. Um, study in the library, so books and silence, all of these might connect up over to here. And you start seeing links through and you can start seeing how your brain is trying to make connections and trying to make patterns there. So actually, mind maps can be a very good, very simple and very easy way of doing anything. OK. Right. The, uh, the next one uh, that we actually have, you can see that again. Uh, is now we have. Right braining. Right braining is the great one. Right braining is all about drawing. So if you are more of a, uh, a drawer, if you look more in pictures than you do in actual words, then we have this as an example. So can I have a theme, please? What do we got? Holiday. Jolly good. Okay, so holiday is our central theme. So instead of writing it now, we'll just put holiday at the top. So now what I have to do is I have to draw any picture that comes to my mind when I think of uh, a holiday. So what have I got? I've got, um, I've got a sun. Okay. Remember, you are leaving a picture partly undrawn here. Uh, what else? What else can we think of? I can think of a C. I haven't got a blue pen, but I can think of a C uh, within there. What else? I could think of a sun lounger. Uh, what, sun what, lounger. What, what? Sorry? Probably not a sun lounger I think you'd want to lie on here, but there we are. Uh, what do we have? We have something a bit like that. So that's a sun lounger, um, maybe a uh, bottle of sun cream. Uh, there. Okay, fine. So you get the point. You start right there drawing down any pictures that come up with those particular words. What you're then trying to do, the right brainers amongst us, are trying to find connections between these pictures. So you start looking at your pictures, what have you got? Uh, can you see any patterns or anything to connect? So you've left pictures un incomplete. What I can see is that I've left an incomplete pattern here. So maybe what I can do is create uh, a cup holder or a bottle holder onto a sun lounger. So my creative idea that I'm coming out with from right braining is that I want to design a sun lounger that has a particular part or a particular section available for you to be able to put your sun cream in. Really, really very basic example, but it kind of works. It kind of works. This is a much better idea, much more technologically advanced. If you had a picture of streamers at a party and a picture of an aeroplane and you left those two pictures incomplete, then if you put them together, you might come up with a creative idea of having a kite or a streamer plane up in the air. OK, so that works for those who are actually far more visual. And this one, as I said at the start, works for the actors out there. The glass half full 
versus the glass half empty people. Okay, you want to start off with a topic. You need a friend for this one. You start off with a topic of conversation and the phrase, how about? Okay, then the negative person, this half empty person, will turn around and say, can't possibly. Then the glass half full person would have to reply with something far more costly. When starting and using words like, we could do this, or it might be possible, etc. So if we have one, uh, let's give you an example. Um, ultimately, uh, how about throwing a party tonight? The glass half empty person, that negative person might say, we can't possibly, I haven't told my parents, um, or I can't possibly, we've got no food in. The glass half full person would then have to come back with something like, well, we could tell your parents, we could go to the supermarket, we should go and prepare for this in advance, something like that, okay? And you keep coming up with new themes in order to do it. The purpose behind doing this for unlocking your creativity is you stop blocking ideas. You're always trying to come up with something positive when someone else says something negative. And we all know negative people. Well, I'm sure we all know someone who will say something negative along the way, okay? We want to be the positive, creative, driving force. So those are a few that really work for, for me and for students that I end up working with. Can we not be dismissive about this? If we've got parents on the line as well as students and uh, obviously agents in here, the power of social media and gaming in creativity. Social media and gaming get such a negative reputation from adults and we sniff at them and we say that's not education at all, but it is. This is it. If someone says they're not creative and they're an adolescent, so you were a teenager growing up, how is that possible? because think of what social media actually is. Social media imposes limitations on you all the time. So you have to think inside the box and use that box strategy. Twitter, contrary to Donald Trump's belief, only allows you a certain number of characters in order to be able to say what you want to say. So you have to be creative with how you're putting it forward. Instagram, you're using pictures in order to be able to do it and only allowed to say so many things. So you have to be creative with how many hashtags you use after it. And the ultimate lockdown revolution, I don't know if you've got into TikTok, but TikTok has been a massive thing, particularly during lockdown, as people have to come up with creative dance videos in order to increase their views and likes and all those sorts of things. But you have, again, limitations placed on you. If you can do all of that, you are already thinking as a creative person. Um, don't necessarily do this one now, but do it in your own time. Um, I just want to show you the power of social media. I saw this one on uh, Instagram earlier on in lockdown. And just try the exercise at home on your own. Uh, all I would want you to do is to firstly, if you've seen this before, you don't have to do it. But you look down this list of words. The first thing you would have to do is say this list of words, but put foot in front of everything. So it starts with foot, 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 say, foot two. The second way of doing it is then to say those words again, but this time put foot after it. So it's now foot, foot, say foot, two foot, etc. The third way of doing it is to put foot either side. So foot, 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 say foot, foot, two foot, etc., etc. And speed. So we're looking at speed of thought here as well as the power of influencing. And then all I want you to do is go back, stop, and then read up from the bottom as quick as you can. Okay. And that is a really interesting exercise. If you get the purpose of that, then eventually message me, okay? And then the last one at the bottom, how is gaming relevant to the, I'm gonna overgeneralize and be a touch, touch sexist here, but to the boys of this world, and indeed the girls as well, computer games have a real, particularly one if you want to go into medicine, okay? Now, having interviewed for a lot of medics in my time, I can tell you that people who are good at computer games work in a wonderful way. Their brain is wired in to be able to do two things at once. It proves manual dexterity as much as anything else. And computer games are not like they were in the past. They are so advanced now and so clever and full of so much artificial intelligence that they demand creativity from you. So I'm encouraging you to play computer games. Not all day, every day, don't forget your education, but do play computer games because they are a proven ability to multitask. And so to the adults and to the parents out there, do not dismiss them, encourage them, obviously maybe put a bit of a time limit on them. We can also think creatively about replacements for work experience. If I'm working with a student and we can't do something and lockdown is teaching us that, what can we use? Well, we need to use our brains to think creatively about how we can do it. For medicine nowadays, 
Uh, medicine, I keep using to it as my go-to point because it is the one that demands so much. But what about work experience if you can't get it? And this will apply out of lockdown as well to anyone globally who isn't able to just wander into a hospital and get experience. I've put a couple of links onto this page so you can see, but there are now online trainings, online um, examples of shadowing doctors, and that is going to be just as good as actually being able to visit hospitals, because not even British students are going to be able to visit hospitals for a long time, unless, of course, they have some sort of illness, which obviously we hope that they do not. But use the internet, and this works for other subjects too. OK, it's not just about watching operations on the Internet and YouTube is a great resource. Watch TED Talks, watch online lectures. Universities have even started doing their own podcasts and vlogs to showcase their material, to show what this course is actually about and to really guide you into the course. So creativity says not that you can't do something, but you will always be able to find something if you look for it. So we as educators are trying to actually signpost those links for students. Um, if you want to go into something financial, why not start your own trading business? Or I lose sight nowadays of how many students I interview who tell me that they have their own fashion brand. Ultimately, that might not be anything more than they're just trading on eBay. But it's brilliant because it's practical experience as to how you go about buying and selling. Doing nothing, it's a choice. But it's made by someone who is actually missing the creative thought process to figure out the problem. There's always an answer to a problem. So what else can we be doing? Please read. Read the papers. Read fiction. Fiction is amazing to free your mind, okay, to allow you to dream and to actually uh, envisage a different world. Talk to someone who has a difference of opinion with you. Students, that's often talking to parents. Um, if you want to talk politics with someone, if you want to talk religion, all the no-no subjects. It's good because then you should be able to balance an argument from two sides. Um, I put a, a little workout one on there. Workouts as well are a brilliant creative tool because think of what endorphins do to your body. They recharge the, uh, the imaginative process. They recharge the energy within your body. Come up with creative ways of one, working out, but while you're working out, maybe actually be thinking about some of the problems that you are currently experiencing. Maybe even work out with your subjects. Go and do a, a cycle ride where on the bike you are reading the book at the same time. Or in your ears, you're not listening to heavy dance music, but you're listening to a podcast. Mixing two styles together, it might sound strange, but it can also just give you something you didn't necessarily think of before. Um, the sound of music and the magic of movies. Uh, music is a very powerful tool. Music can elicit different creative responses from us, whether it's going to be dance music, whether it's going to be classical music. Um, think of people in industry who often listen to things uh, in their ears while they're working because it helps them focus in different way. And the magic of the movies, watch movies. Movies give you inspiration. They give you creativity within there as well. Maybe it's the way the movie is made. Maybe it's the theme of what it is. Maybe it's inspiring you into a career. Watch suits, you might be a, a lawyer. Watch ER, you might want to be a doctor. Um, watch, uh, I don't know, um, uh, <laughs> Saving Private Ryan and you want to join the army. Something in there, it's very basic, it's very simplistic, but if you can't find anything else as a starting place into creativity, then listening to something or watching it, something is a very good cheat. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to presume that technology is not going to allow us to do this, but what I have uh, after this is a video on layering. I'm going to miss the video out for now, but when we send the presentation, hopefully uh, you'll be able to watch it. Layering is an exercise used uh, in drama. Layering works a little bit like this. You have someone who enters into the scene. The scene uh, is blank, there is no setting to it. They sit there and they have no response. They stand up and they leave. You don't get very much from that. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they're thinking. The next thing that happens, therefore, is then you ask them to come into the scene and have more of a response. And now we're trying to introduce elements into the scene that gives you a setting for this particular uh, scene and for this person. So now we know where it's set. We still don't know very much about the person. So we need to start layering up creativity to bring us some sort of characterization. 
and now you ask the character to come back in again, maybe they have a reaction, or they come back in and you introduce variables into the scene, like music. Again, music to give you different ways of playing around with it. Actors absolutely love to use layering as a technique, and I like to use it with students as well, because it gets them to do something completely unexpected. If you give them a stimulus, if you give them a variable, something happens to them that they didn't necessarily expect, and something that you can't actually block. We'll move on from that, and this way I can quickly whip through the remaining bits. I did a TED talk about two years ago on telling stories. Okay, that's not a shameless plug. It's something that I actually really relate to. I love the idea of telling stories. Telling stories gives you so much. Okay, we all like to listen to stories, and if you can tell a story, then ultimately you can describe neatly to someone what it is that you want to get across. Now, all stories, there's no such thing as an original story. They're all built and based upon something that has come before. If you think of most Hollywood films, they are all based upon this, the hero's journey, and they all come up with a very similar pattern that goes through it. So there isn't such a thing as an original story, but there is such a thing as being creative in order to tell that story in an original way. And the point I'm driving at is just because someone's done it before, doesn't mean you should stop wanting to do it yourself. Have a little look at this book if you can. It's by a French writer, uh, Raymond Queno, and it's called The Exercises in Style. And he tells a story. It's a very, very simple two-line story, but he tells it in 99 different ways. And every single time he tells that particular story, the actual meaning of it changes. And for me, it's the ultimate book in creative expression. So have a little bit of a read. It works for anyone from any country because it is so simplistic in terms of the way it's actually written. But then the adaptation in 99 different ways allows you to have some sort of emotive response. And you'll find that some of those versions work for you and some of them will not. So practical. When we are doing this with students, we do something called the think links, okay? Think links, you can do this with lots of different examples. I want to do storylines with you. So can someone give me four random words, please? This is great if a student doesn't know exactly how to start writing or something. Four random words, anything at all. Feels like a magic trick and it's not. Um, four random words, please. Tree. Tree. Okay. Anything else? Fairy car. Fairy car. Fairy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And flowers. Car and flowers. Okay. So, a nice little exercise to get a student to learn how to start thinking creativity here. Uh, it's called the Think Link and it's called the Storyline. And what you need to do is get these four words into a very brief story. So I'm just going to write a very brief story for you here. Okay. Um, there once was a fairy who lived in a tree in a tree. Uh, one day, she was out picking flowers, picking flowers when she was run over by a car. bit macabre, but there you go. You've got a story, you, or at least you've got the start of a story. Then the next thing you need to do is to keep introducing random words into that. So you can come up with any sort of story based on the words in front of you. If you get students to do simple little exercises from this, it really starts firing the brain. That then leads on, and I'll give you a little example there on the actual thing. Um, then you can also try the four story with them as well. This time, get two random words. Use them as the first part of your story and then keep adding in words to develop the story. This is if four random words actually phases them a little bit. And I've given you an example there that you can have a look at in your own time. You come up with something, okay? Then you start introducing more random words and hopefully, the more random words you introduce, the longer that particular story 
Yes, I went to a writing symposium once, and this was where I picked up the idea in terms of you go around the circle and everyone has to introduce a new word. There's a, a, a very basic child's exercise as well, which is when I went on holiday, I packed. And then you have to go through the alphabet saying the next thing in the sequence that you packed, remembering everything that you bought in from before as well. So when I went on holiday, I packed uh, an apple. Uh, and then the next person, when I went on holiday, I packed an apple and a beach ball. And then the next person would have C, but still remembering everything that came before it. It's a great memory exercise and it's a great association exercise to use too. Um, I've used this many times in many presentations. Uh, I don't want to do it now. What I want to do is instead say this to you, sell me this pen. This pen exercise is a good one for creativity because it gets students trying to know who they are. But I'm not coming at it from that perspective today. I'm trying to say to you something different, which is it's about the power of questions and what we can actually guide our students to as well. So we are trying to get students to understand what sort of questions that they would ask. OK, there's a great study that basically said that we spend more of our time actually talking about ourselves. And if people like talking about themselves, then you should get them talking about themselves. Ask questions to stop making judgments. OK, but how can we be more creative instead of it just being the pen exercise? If you don't mind just muting your microphone, that'd be kind. And um, if you don't mind with this pen exercise, what else could you do with it? It's not just about selling the pen, but you might draw with it. Or you might, this is a great one. We live in a name dropping world. Maybe you'll say that Dua Lipa uses uh, this particular pen, or this is Tom Hanks's favorite brand or something. And then the simplicity of our buying mind starts wanting that pen because someone else has it. Uh, you could use it as the second hand on the clock, or this is a better one. We could use it as part of a drama game. Now there's a great drama game, which you can use either with individuals or as a group, which is to say everything that this pen is not. OK, so what you do is you get a student to pick up a random article, so this time a pen, and instead of saying it's a pen, they have to say it's everything but. So this is not a pen. This is a banana. This is not a pen. This is a mobile phone. This is not a pen. This is a seat. This is not a pen and so on. OK, and the more things that they can think of, it sounds very absurdist, but in being absurdist, it shakes through an idea. Why is this important for us to know and the students to know as well? Well, because the more you know about someone, the more you can actually help them to be creative and you can find the right technique that works for them. Finding something that's unique to the individual, making it tailored, not uniform, makes it relatable. Okay? When I work with students, I look from a multifaceted approach. You want to know who they are, what they want to do, what do they like, what do they not like, who are their influences, uh, what they do for fun. Uh, what they do to relax, who stresses them out, what stresses them out, all of these different things. And once you have that information, you can then apply these uh, examples to it. Um, give you examples. Here. If you have a sporty student who's not keen on academics, why not? Why not get them to go and study while playing sports? You know, take them on a round of golf to study uh, biology, take them to the gym to listen to a personal statement podcast. Um, if you have a dramatic student, why don't you play improvisation games with them? Uh, that's the half full, half empty game. If you have an art student, why not take them to a place that is uh, particularly creative, like an art gallery or somewhere outside, which is particularly beautiful, and get them to do a mind map in that visual way? Um, those with problems focusing class uh, might uh, benefit from a scavenger hunt, which, uh, which I'll just mention in a second. Those are too serious. Um, get them to uh, just read the gossip pages of a newspaper just so it frees them up from being too serious and tries to get them to start thinking about something else. And those who are too immature will focus their mind a bit more with riddles. We get all sorts of students. I work with so many different types of people and you've got to tap into the individual. I'm not going to do this because we've done it. But what I did want to say is it's a great way of actually approaching a personal statement is to draw the body to actually then get this through. You can see this on the link that will be sent through to you later. Break up, compartmentalize, see the problem as a picture, as a drawing, and then re-envisage it from there, okay? And always keep this in mind. To any students on the link and to anyone educating someone, permanently challenge someone. Creativity comes from the ability to be able to persuade someone on what you're thinking. So always say to them, and so what? And they should always be able to justify their decision. Okay.
just to wind us down here, interviews. Uh, interviews um, are something we will all face in our life, whether it's going to be for schools, whether it's going to be for universities, or whether it's going to be for jobs. Riddles are a good way of also waking you up for an interview itself. Uh, and it leads very neatly into the final point. So just have a quick go at these ones if you can. Very quickly, divide 30 by half and then add 12. What are you going to get if you did that? Andy, if you don't get this one, I'll be gravely disappointed in you. Twenty-seven from most. Uh, just so we can move it on, it's not twenty-seven. It's seventy-two because, uh, and it's a great, and this is why riddles are good for waking up your creativity. Look at the information given in front of your very eyes. If you divide thirty by half, you're dividing it by 0.5, which is the equivalent of timesing thirty by two and adding twelve. So it's seventy-two and not twenty-seven. Um, can you put ten coins into three glasses so that each glass contains an odd number of? Coins. Anyone managed to complete that one? Get your students to do these sorts of things before going into anything. If they are woken up properly and they are looking at the information given in front of them, they will absolutely succeed and fly through an interview. Can you do this one? 10 coins, three glasses. Five, four, three, two, one. No, okay. Oh, we just... Six. Sorry? I think two, what we need... Two and Two, two and six. Each glass needs to have an odd number of coins, okay? But no one ever said in this particular example that you couldn't put a glass inside another glass. So in essence, if you had a five, a three and a two, and you put the three into the two glass, you are still managing to complete the exercise. Uh, four matchsticks, can you get a perfect square by just moving one? Five, four, three, two, one. Anyone? Betty, I'm sure you're on the cusp of this, but all you're doing, if you look at what you've got here, look at the matchstick in the middle, you move it, you create the square. So everything is right in front of your eyes. Okay, so just riddles wake you up before an interview. Use these exercises. Creativity of expression before you go into interviews can help you get through them. OK, um, pick topics. OK, good, great, great exercise to do with people is to pick a topic and explain it to someone who has absolutely no idea about that particular topic. If you can manage to explain it to them, then you will have been able to get your point across. How can you work out if they've understood it or we'll get them to summarize it back to you? Um, use the half empty, half full question. So you're always trying to find a positive to any sort of question. The originality of thought. Um, if I said to you, uh, what could you do with a coat hanger? And your one expression back to me was, well, you can put your coat onto it and hang it up. Then ultimately, you're not going to be scoring very highly on the creative scale. But if you were to say, uh, I would take this coat hanger and I would break it down um, into its component molecules by, by melting it and uh, somehow convert it into rocket fuel in order to um, power a spaceship to the moon, then ultimately your brain is thinking in a slightly different way, albeit whether it's possible and practical or whatever, but you are trying to think of something other than the basic. Uh, use the uh, one minute, two minute, three minute teaches. Um, get your students to read something every day and summarize it uh, in five sentences, three sentences, uh, and then one sentence. Um, take something apart, put it back together and explain what you're doing as you're going along. That's a great one for engineering. Um, or just try and complete everyday actions and get them to uh, with someone else, explain them to someone else, and they can only do what it is that you were asking them to do. So explain someone how to tie a tie or Adam's great example of tying a shoot lace. Okay, Doing something like that where someone 
can only do what you're asking them to do forces that person to be able to actually um, think more creatively about how to do it. And then the very last thing, just to wrap this up, is I love these nowadays. You find them in every country. I've found them every time I've traveled. You can do scavenger hunts or you can do um, panic rooms or escape rooms or whatever you call them. It's puzzles for a determined period of time. Scavenger hunts are very good in order to free up creativity of students because they move you from place to place and you do different things when you are actually there. They give you riddles and puzzles in order to solve and your mind gets an element of satisfaction from being able to do it. It also then starts kicking in the energy and the endorphin levels as you move through the actual puzzle. So, very quick one for you. All children were born artists. Who said this? What room would you go to afterwards? And specifically, I'm basing this one in MPW. Now we can't move around within the four walls today, but I can do what we're about to look at. So this is based upon MPW, the MPW scavenger hunt. All children were born artists. Who said this? And then what room would you go to after that? I'm sure there's some educated people out there. Very good. That is right. The answer was indeed Pablo Picasso, and here we are in the MPW art room. Possibly that one was a little bit too easy for you, though. So let's see how you get on with this one. So, the art room, Pablo Picasso, is your next clue. This is needed for both courage and hardcover books. What am I and where would you go? That's right, you guessed it. It is indeed the spine, the spine of the book and the spine of the body for courage. And now, on to your next room. So the library. And the last one for you. This ancient invention allows people to see through walls. What is it? Window, very good. And where would you most expect in a building like MPW's to find no windows at all? Remember, we have six floors here. That's right, the basement. You've done it, hurrah. The answer was indeed window. Where would you expect not to find too many windows? Well, that would be the basement down here in MPW, where we are currently in the coffee shop, surrounded by the student common rooms. Scavenger hunts can be an excellent way of unlocking creativity, and there's a great deal of companies now that actually do this, both for young and indeed old. And I can't recommend them to you highly enough, particularly if you're trying to unlock creativity. Uh, Laura, uh, you, you're rapidly becoming my favourite person for suggesting that we have a parking lot. Um, I wish we had a parking lot. It would make travelling to and from work so much better. However, we don't have a parking lot. But I like the creativity of thought that you have within that. Look, let's just let's just sum this up at the end and, and then uh, then move on. I mean, everyone is creative. You did the one minute teach fairly easily. You can do anything. If you can do a one minute teach to somebody, then you ultimately are going to be uh, able to do anything with a creative mindset. Get your students to do it. Try and teach anything to anybody. If you can do it in one minute, try and make it harder and teach someone in two minutes. Try and pick a harder topic and do it in three minutes. Okay, don't go over three minutes because people will get bored. But ultimately, try and do those teaches. The word no is banned. You've got to say, okay, fine, and give it a go. Okay, just try everything. Try and tap into what makes you, or if you are an educator, try and tap into what makes your students unique and individual, and then try some of these varying different techniques that you will have when I send this PowerPoint presentation over to you. 
remember the imagination of a child. Try and get yourself into that childlike mindset because it is so freeing, liberating, and wonderful about how much creativity you can come up with. And never be afraid to get something wrong. Don't be so socially aware that people are going to judge you. Try and actually come at this from the perspective of, I don't care. If you don't care whether you get something right or wrong, but you're willing to give it a go, who knows what can happen, all right? And very literally, it comes to the end. Um, what I would like to say to you all is thank you for trying to bear with me during the technology. Um, I would send this out to you once it has been recorded properly because hopefully it's a useful resource where you can just dip in and dip out. Everyone's got an opinion as to how to be creative. I'm no psychologist. Um, I am just someone who likes to try different techniques along the way to try and see how to actually work with an individual as we go along. One size never fits all. Yes, it's the MPW trading model, but also it's what I firmly believe in life is one size does not fit all. You have to work out who you have in front of you and then work with them. So many apologies um, uh, for the technology. Thank you for allowing me to be creative to try and find solutions as we go through. Um, and if you have anything else to uh, ask me, please do say it now. Sorry to have kept you for so long. Um, I think that's probably every sorry I can come up with because I'm so English. So over to you, Betty, uh, if there's anything uh, you want to say. Thank you so much, James. That was a great uh, session. All I've realised is I'm not creative at all. Um, so some <laughs> great tasks there. Um, to sort of keep me busy, I think, during this lockdown. So thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for James? It's going to be quite a hard one to come up with questions too, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. As, as James said, um, this session is recorded and um, we will put it up for you so that you can revisit it. Um, but this will be recorded again properly uh, so that you can use it at a later stage with your students or with your counsellors in the offices. Um, as usual, if you do have any questions, please do email international at mpw.ac.uk. Um, oh, we do have a question, James. Oh. We have a, what do you do when you have a writer's block or when you are put on the spot? Uh, right. What do you do when you have a writer's block? OK, uh, well, you try something completely different. You move yourself out of the exercise. So if you have a writer's block about a certain thing, then it's a very good idea to try and go back to maybe some of those um, think links that you did before. Come up with four random words. Do it. Uh, try and write a completely random and creative story based upon absolutely nothing. So find creative random words, write a little bit of a story. Yes, it's not directly relevant to your particular topic, but the first thing it does is it shakes you back through okay it suddenly shakes you to life and your brain starts firing in a different way if you don't want to try that then try some puzzles and actually just try and build up the creative speed of thought again because a mind block is where the brain starts slowing down again because it can't work out what it is it's hit a barrier so it goes into reverse we want to wake it up and send it in the other direction once you've woken it up whether with think links or um, the puzzles or whatever do your mind mapping Put that problem into the middle and then start just saying the first thing that comes into your mind. Now your brain has speeded up again. It will start coming up with random connections. Throw it at the board and then start seeing what sticks. Once you can then see it, eventually you will find a connection that works for you and hopefully it should move on. If none of those techniques work, and then try a different one entirely. Grab a friend and talk to them about the particular problem. Start with doing something like a, a glass half full, glass half empty on something different and then build it up to actually bringing in that topic. Word association works quite nicely with this topic as well. So if you brainstorm around the particular subject matter using word association uh, with someone else, then you might be amazed at what sort of ideas can come through. For writer's block, the point being, you always have to try a variety of different things to see what works for you, but you should always try something. Now, if you're put on the spot and you're trying to think of something creative in that particular moment in time, that's hard if your brain is switched off. Hopefully, you're only ever put in a position where you're on the spot when you're partway through a day or whether you're part way through an interview. And if you've done your preparation at the start of the day and you've actually uh, done some uh, puzzles to wake yourself up, you've read the paper, you've read the gossip pages, you've done any of those sorts of things and your brain is a bit more wired to it, then when you're thinking on the spot, 
just say the first thing that comes into your mind. It might sound like a very dangerous thing to do, but we're adults at the end of the day, we're not silly. Um, say the first thing that comes into your mind. If it is something silly, you can then start pairing back. But when you hear it out loud, your brain then starts making sense of it. If you say nothing at all and you overthink the problem, the silence tends to linger for a little bit too long. People are very forgiving of you if you say that, as long as it's not rude, as long as you say the first thing that comes into your mind and then you think around it. Because me as the listener won't remember the first thing you said, I will remember the last thing you said once you've found the connection. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if that helps, but the idea is to try different things. Great, thank you, James. Um, we have a question from Karen who says, as educators, how do we encourage our students to bring more content and narratives to their verbal and written tasks? Um, very good question. I mean, Karen, what I'm going to say again is uh, me, me not being an absolute authority on anything. I can only give you the ideas uh, that I that I personally would actually try and, and bring to uh, something. How can you get students to bring more content? I would always go back to the mind mapping technique and combine it with research, okay? Because if you're gonna bring content into something, you need to have some substance behind it. Once they've done the research, the, for me, mind mapping has never never usually failed in a way because you should always get everything down. It's, it's a brain dump, it's a, it's a vomiting almost onto a, a piece of paper there. The right braining idea with having some pictures uh, as well, uh, just gets any sort of content or the first thing that comes into your brain onto it. Um, when you're talking about the narratives, narratives is, is all about the story that makes it unique to, uh, to the individual within there. Um, uh, hang on, sorry, forgive me, my connection's just virtually dropped for a second. Um, so uh, what I'd want you to do is to get your students to sit down in groups of two or three or four or whatever it might be and to actually start with create a different story together, create a different uh, narrative. It's something that has a start, a middle, an end, something that has a surprising twist or whatever it might be from there so that they can understand structure. From there, uh, then you can move on into the actual mind mapping and the brain dump and see what actually comes out from that particular uh, idea and then build it into the narrative uh, that they should have before. You can't get away with narrative if you haven't done research because otherwise everything is just made up uh, on the spot, a bit like this presentation in lots of ways. You need to have some sort of substance and research behind it uh, first. Once you've read through a student's work and if there isn't enough content and narrative within there, what you then want to do creatively is get them to actually read someone else's for a start, get students to exchange work between them. And uh, instead of doing that, you might want to actually get them to say a paragraph out loud. Instead of writing it down, get them to speak it to you first. If they can say everything that, that you want to say out loud before putting pen to paper, then the mind block isn't actually in effect. It's a writer's block, and we just need to teach them how to actually put the words onto the paper. The more you can get someone to actually speak and verbalize something, then the easier, hopefully, it will become. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, at another point, obviously. Great. Thank you very much, James. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. We'll just wait. A lot of appreciation, James, for the session. So thank you. Um, and just, yeah, to reiterate, thank you so much, James, for, uh, for sure. this session. Um, and as I said, we will record this and send it out later today together with the presentation um, that James has shared with us, which will include the videos. Is that right? Yeah, James? that is absolutely right. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more coherent and cohesive. And can I just say, um, from where I'm sat, and I'm sat in MPW at the moment, a very quiet MPW, but out the window, the sun is shining, uh, the world is coming out of hibernation. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and well, um, but it's starting to feel like business as usual again. And so uh, I personally cannot wait to see people in September. Um, and hopefully I might meet you all on the road at some point. But in the meantime, I hope you are all safe and well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yes, to reiterate, please stay safe and well. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of day. And thank you very much, James. No problem. Bye -bye. All the very best.